Hey, everybody. Welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby. I have an uh, extremely fun guest today. It is the, uh, um, I've been waiting for a long time to have her on. Uh, one, because I wanted to get the podcast right. And I think after 83 episodes, I think we finally are getting hitting our stride, damn it. Uh, but number two, uh, one of the more important human beings in, uh, in my life. And so she is the, uh, the, the genius behind editing this, uh, this book of mine. And I would not have done it without her. So I am, uh, am extraordinarily happy uh, to have my good friend, Lana Whiting, uh, the official Do Good, Better podcast. Lana, how are you today? I am good. That was an amazing introduction. I feel very important now, but- You should. Thank you, thank you so much. You yeah. should be very, you should be very important. So uh, for those of you who don't uh, know Lana, you should. You should be following her. You should go to Lana uh lana's website what is this now we what are we at we're at lana co.co it's lana.co so l-o-n-n-a dot co <laughs> so you need to yes up the name. i love yeah. it it's fantastic i think you should go there immediately and click on one of the links in the uh in the program notes and you should follow everything that she writes she's brilliant and uh and we're going to talk a little bit about a couple of things today we're going to talk about writing we're going to talk about topics we're going to talk about editing we're going to talk about uh content uh we're going to talk about alzheimer's and i think that's an interesting topic that we don't get to talk about much here on the official do good better podcast uh but it's a topic that is near and dear to lana's heart we're going to talk about uh well we're going to talk about a bunch of things today but if you're scrolling through uh, iTunes and you're scrolling through Facebook and you see Lana's uh, delightful face and you're like, that seems like an interesting person. I want to get to know her. Lana, give us a 5,000 foot view on who you are, what you do and how on earth uh, you're doing today. Well, my 5,000 foot view, I am a writer and editor and really don't know how to do anything else in my life. Um, I have been a writer since forever. I was that geek in high school who lettered in journalism. So had I gotten a letterman's jacket, I would have had a pen and quill on it, which is pretty sweet. I never did do that. But um, <clears throat> I went to Minnesota State University Moorhead and got a degree in English and then also a master's degree in creative writing. After that, I worked at the forum as a copy editor and then became an editor at the Village Family Service Center. So I had um, a lot of great nonprofit experience there and then was promoted, or not promoted, but um, scooped up by Stanford Health and became a copywriter. And from there became a copywriter at a couple other organizations in town. And then finally decided in July 2019 that I wanted to try writing and editing on my own and started Lana.co and now have my own suite of clients who are amazing and I love them very much. And it was the best decision ever to become my own um, content organization in content development, um, marketing planning, a little bit of project management, a lot of editing. Um, a lot of people have um, caught on that I like to edit and I'm fairly good at it. So editing some books right now with some clients and it's fantastic. It's just, it's been great. There is, um, there are very few people that I trust with um, anything I do brand wise or content wise. And Lana is one of them, um, which makes them like there's three people. And so Lana is one of the three people that I, that I trust with this. And it is my, as my secret weapon, if I am trying to figure out how to say something, I will send her manuscripts and go, am I way off base? Do I sound like a whore? Like, do I, is this awful? And she will be kind enough to say, it's not awful. And then there'll be like a little ellipsis there, but I'll, I'll, I'll work on it. Uh, so uh, the reason that I, that, I, that I sound like I know what I'm talking about is probably Lana's hand uh, in this. And yes, she is a genius when it comes uh, to topic writing. Um, I've always found it amazing that some of these nonprofits, and you've worked with them before too, that have these wonderful stories, but they don't know how to tell it correctly. Is Do you find that it is more because they are scared to put something on paper or they are scared to not sound like they know what they're doing? Or is it just the concept of writing that gets in people's heads that they don't know how to kind of uh, put, put two and two together? 
I think it's a, a combination of things. I think first and foremost, there's a lot of pressure on everybody, not just nonprofits, but anybody um, that's trying to market a product or service to write in a certain way that is going to get them clicks or make them popular and boost boost their activity on Google. And they so they they're already putting pressure on themselves to write in a certain way that's going to get them um, the metrics that they're looking for. And I think that that is problematic because you're not writing to your authentic self or your authentic company. Mm -hmm. And it automatically gets you into trouble a little bit um, because you're not focused on the story, you're focused already ahead of the game, focusing on the metrics. Um, and I think people are afraid to tell hard, difficult stories. They're afraid to put themselves out there mm -hmm. because they don't want to abandon a potential donor or maybe a donor who might not have the same perspective as you do. Um, they're afraid that they might offend somebody with their opinion or something that might have happened um, at their organization or in, in their lives that may resonate with 500,000 people, but five really important people might not like it very much. And that gives people a very great amount of anxiety um, when it comes to writing blog posts or letters or um, appeals in particular, we get into this pattern where we stay in that safety zone. And that safety zone is is serviceable, but you know, if you push yourself a little bit out of those limits, you might find yourself attracting new and different donors that have um, that maybe align more with your vision and mission for your company. I'll give you a prime example of that from my own personal experience is that the, the more envelope that I push towards um, transparency of local and regional private foundations or the where I get on a soapbox to say, I know I'm right in this corner where you need to do this, this and this within the community and really call, not call out people because it's not a name I'm going to associate a name with, but just, hey, here's the principle by which you need to go. I have found a flurry of personal notes and messages rather than outward likes on the analytics side. And it's interesting because I think we chase these vanity metrics on Facebook and LinkedIn, but really the biggest impact that you're making is people are reading it and not reacting on social media because they're fearful of whatever they like that you write. And yet it, it resonates with them exponentially more than some of the fluff fun pieces, the memes that I sort of create on a regular basis. There, there's a deeper hit and so it, to sprinkle those in between some of those things that feel good, I think it's super important to maintain balance because you can't be one personality the entire time that people are going to see through that. Like I'm genuinely one of the happiest and enthusiastic human beings on earth, but there are frustrating times where I'm sort of like looking at, uh, you know, or I'll write about certain frustrations that will resonate a lot. A lot more. And that's the delicate balance. And so my question to you is, how do you find your voice within an organization that maybe counter, I don't know what's it counterintuitive or counterproductive, but like it's counter to whatever your forward facing marketing plan is at an organization, which are relatively safe. How do you balance that? Because authentically you is probably not aligned 100% with the approved marketing verbiage that's used and yet people want to hear authentic you rather than the canned answers and things so how do you balance this especially writing how do you balance that yeah um <clears throat> i would say to one of two things either just go for it and and be bold and daring enough to show your organization that there is a, a different approach and um and see where that goes or baby steps, you know, start with your kind of templated letter or templated blog posting where you start with a story of a client and then you go into 
the stats of how the organization helps the, help the client. And then you follow up with how the client's doing today. You know, I mean, that's pretty basic stuff that you see, but maybe insert something in there that that you wouldn't normally add, add a little bit to your template, add a little bit of, of color, um, editorialize, you know, put yourself in there, you know, and, and write, instead of writing objectively, write from, I met this client and this client changed my life mm -hmm. because of what they went through. And here's how our, our organization was able to help. And so suddenly if you're switching that point of view to, a personal account, you are giving somebody more a more humanized look at um, a story that might have fallen flat because a lot of those stories sound the same now because everybody's kind of writing the same the same narrative for their for their organization. And I think it's really important that people give to people, not organizations. And I think more. I think we ignore that. Um, personal connection when we write because we do it when we meet with people right i mean that's the we've got that buzzword here when we're we're talking with donor with uh with individuals and how do you how do you get new donors and how do you make those yeah it's personal relationships like we do it face to face and yet when we write we are this broad strokes i don't want to offend anyone even though when you would go in for a coffee and you would build a rapport with a donor on a personal one-on-one -on -one basis, you're talking intimately about certain subjects and, and, and criteria to how to match a donor with an organization, et cetera. So um, it's so funny, we talk outside of both ends of our, our mouth when we're, we're doing it in private, but we don't do it in public in the writing space. And how to attract some of those folks is to sort of go out on a limb and, and put that personal narrative because now they're giving to you as a person rather than an institution because your mission statement doesn't mean anything if you don't have some sort of relatability in the field and writing can help you um, kind of do that a lot. Uh, I think one of the dangers um, that we can get into when we write though is what my friend Scott Burlingang says uh, is coined inspiration porn and it is that just obnoxious Sally Struthers, look at this starving child that has no malnourished. I'm going to take a video of him bathing in sludge. I'm not going to help this kid. I'm just going to watch him do it while I can document it so I can tell you about it. How do you, how do you get out of that route? Because it's so easy to give the low, it's the lowest common denominator when it comes to writing, especially appeals, is look at this poor kid with Down syndrome. Look at this poor, poor child with autism you can never never be whole as a person like what the hell is that like it's the worst how do you get out of that rut oh i don't know we should call up the aspca on their dog commercials too because those are those 100%. are 100 percent true it's but just i'm going to like, take a video of this dog in chains i'm not going to undo the chains first i need to document it because then you need to see how sad it is. So Sarah McLaughlin can rip your heart out during the Super Bowl or whatever <laughs> sporting event that I don't want to be sad at. Right, you can't I'm a Vikings fan, it. I'm already sad. I don't have enough sadness to get <laughs> ACPA says whatever the hell it is. No, get out of my face. So how do we avoid that? This is, the, this is a troublesome spot because it's an easy, it's easy. Inspiration porn is easy. How do, you, how do you take what you want to do naturally and just give this, horrible account of what you were trying to solve and then spin it into that positive realm because i think positivity is, is is what people are looking for am i wrong right yeah i mean you are absolutely correct and i think you said it unchain the dog you know unchain the dog um cheer the kid with cancer <laughs> show them show them that you're not just showing a problem you're showing the solution to it and that solution lies in the support that they receive from people like like you know dedicated donors and supporters of the organization mm -hmm. um the most positive thing you can do is, is show the positive outcome um unchain the dog that would be i think we found the title for this episode by the way 
it's called Unchain the Dog. And this is yeah. going to be one of those callback pieces to the actual uh, stuff where I always look for like, hey, is somebody going to say the title of the movie in the movie? I'm always looking for when I watch a movie and they're like, hey, oh, they said Braveheart. Oh, and then I'm like, ah, oh, that was the part. Or oh, they determined that that was the movie. So we just found our title. I appreciate that. Um, the, the, uh, the other one too is um, if, you have, if you have a personality that's radically different than an organization, and um, is, is there ever a time where you have to look at yourself and you can't write because you are so different than what the mission is? Even though you may love your job personality-wise, it doesn't match. Is there ever a time not to write or, or to hold back on things because you are so vehemently disagreeing with like something they do or, or whatever? You know the work is good ground level, but maybe higher up there's just a, you know, an, a gong show how do you how do you separate what you do to what is going on? Uh, well, I know what I would do personally. I would probably not last there. <laughs> I'd probably find sure. something else um, that more aligns with with who I am as a person. But um, I think you know if you have a good leadership team, they they should be willing to talk with you about um, some of your concerns around the messaging and and just having those conversations with, with them at a higher level and explaining to them, you know, some of the ways that we can improve the messaging if they just try something new yeah. uh, is, is something that can be really helpful, especially um, if you don't want to quit your job and find something else that aligns better with, with um, your own personality, because that's obviously not always a feasible situation for people. Um, and the other thing too is is you know looking for the for the good and in, in what in what is already working at the organization as well, um, and latch on to latch on to what what you like and what's resonating with you and do more of that. Um, if there's a flat appeal letter that you keep sending out every year at Christmas, um, maybe just tweak it a little bit in the ways that you know are are safe for your leadership, that they're still going to approve it, um, but that has a little bit of your personality in it as well. And then going back to just changing the point of view, you know, changing it to first person point of view, maybe that won't even um, cause a hiccup in your organization, but you might be worried it will. Um, just try it, um, see what happens. I think, I think testing, uh, A-B testing with some of your writing is a wonderful way to kind of explore the reactions that people will have. So if you have a test run of maybe 30 or 40 donors that get a separate letter in that first person um, that are not the, the carbon copy of what you've done in, in years past, that'd be a really good example. And then your follow-up conversation, like, hey, how did you like that? First of all, it's going to force you to have conversations with your donors over the phone, which is something you should do anyway. Number two, it gives them something to... Uh, read a little bit closer, and you ask for their opinion, which all of a sudden now you're engaging them and not asking them for money, but you're actually engaging them on how that story made them feel rather than what you normally do. So this is such an advantage to organizations who can proactively look at their lists and say, I got 30 people I'd be willing to call and send a separate appeal to just to get their perspectives on, even though I know it's not going to affect their donations because they're not going to get offended by a personal story, but maybe this resonates with them and then maybe I can have a conversation. You can build your analytics and go to your leadership team and say, listen, I had a conversation with 15 of these 30 donors. They all loved this version. Why don't we start moving it down the line? Oh, by the way, they gave more than they've ever given because now we're personalizing it a little bit better. So your A-B testing is 100% right. Is it okay? And I've, and I've worked with clients on both of these fronts. Every year, they send out a Christmas appeal and it's the same appeal because it does really well. And uh, I get a, I get occasionally the pushback on a couple of things. I'm not, I'm not tied to one decision or another. So I'm, I, this is an open-ended question that I will not say, no, you're wrong, Lana, because I don't know what the hell I'm doing, right? Uh, in the writing department. Here's, they would send the same appeal every single Christmas. Some will say, no, we can't do that. I think we need to do uh, something different. And then the other one would be like, nobody remembers the damn appeal in the first place. They remember us. They want to give us money. And so it'll save us time, energy, and effort. Where do you stand? Make a stand, damn it. I want you to make a stand where you go with this. And I'm okay with either one. 
And I just, from a, from a writer's perspective, how does that work? Um, well, I am definitely a proponent of if it isn't broken, don't fix it. So send out the appeal, but eventually the people that you send that appeal letter to every year, they're probably old now. They're, they're going to die, RIP, and maybe the letter needs to eventually, you know, move on to the great beyond as well. Um, absolutely content and those letters need to be refreshed at least every three years at you know, I mean, then that's like a conservative um, estimate, but yeah, I think that the donors who resonate with those, the same letter over and over again, they probably don't remember. They're going to donate anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to the A-B testing, keep sending yeah. them that letter mm -hmm. and then and then draft another one that's a little more bold and and interesting and and refreshing and and maybe youthful and and tackles a younger audience a younger demographic and see how it does um you'd be surprised maybe it doesn't do as well that's fine now you know that that old old person letter works just fine yes but you just gotta gotta experiment, and that's the great thing about writing is it's it's a, it's just an experiment. It's just it's just playing with words on paper. Yes. That's all it is. I love that. Um, I like to use exclamation points. <laughs> um, I know you know this because yeah. I think your first edit in the book was, "My God, there are so many exclamation points." I think that's actually in one of my early edit. Uh, of those things. Um, I know Mark Twain said using an exclamation point is like laughing at your own joke, which is which is funny because I also laugh at my own jokes. So this is very <laughs> authentic to me. Um, so I, I need to get from you, a professional and amazing writer, your top three annoyances while you are editing stuff. What are the three mistakes that you see most often uh, and you cannot use the double space in between uh, sentences. I will not allow this as an answer because I still I still hold true that that is occasionally what I'll do on a regular basis because it's just how I grew up. Um, what are the top three annoyances that you see while you are editing that people can use to avoid, well, they can avoid while they're doing their writing that will make them a better writer? I think um, using the word thing, mm. um, don't use that, be more descriptive. Um, or when somebody says, hey, I did a thing, which is like a really popular phrase now, mm. you know, just Again, tell yes. us like, hey, I sold 15 books. Like, that's a little bit more specific. <laughs> I like that. That's right. better than thing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> using the word very mm. to describe an, a significant amount of something mm. um, is is kind of a cop out. Um, being more specific in the writing is always important. I am not anti exclamation. And I do think that there is a time, a place and a personality for all exclamation points, Patrick. I know. Um, and you, allowed me, you allowed me to keep way more than I thought you were going to allow me to keep. Right. <laughs> I think you here's the here's the thing, though, I think you gave up after like page seven. I think that's where I think I wore you down after page seven. You're like, I can't, I can't stop it. It's not going to happen anyway. So there, yes, there is that. And also I strongly believe as an editor that to keep the person's authentic voice in there. <laughs> and if you were <laughs> a punctuation mark, you would be the exclamation point. But... I appreciate that. <laughs> yes, you're welcome. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right, I'm gonna play a very quick game that I just made up before we went on uh, to record this. And it is, um, should I write about it? So from the perspective of a nonprofit, um, I will probably be uh, looking to write content from now into the end of the year to motivate my donors and my supporters to give. There are probably a billion things I could write about. However, I am uh, not that, uh, that, that smart. And so I just have a small list. 
and I need your opinion as a professional writer and editor of should I write it. I think we need also a, a, a bit of music. So I think I'm going to try to get this as to a recurring theme of uh, should I do this? Should I write about politics? What, do you have to ask me that? Yep, I do. That's that's what this game is that I just made up on our podcast here. Oh man, that's that's hard. That's cruel. No. I know it is. This is not an easy, this is a very, very difficult podcast to get through. I understand this. But these are things that I think people come up with, right? So we're post-election or we're coming down from a, a very like contentious everything. Everybody is mad about stuff there is still this temptation to the last gasps of uh, either left or right or anything in between. It is, instead of uniting, we've got an opinion on politics. Should I write about it towards the end of the year? I would say it depends, which mm -hmm. is a cop-out answer. Love it. That's great. But, That's a very consultant I, answer. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Depends <laughs> on who you are. Uh -huh. But I'm going to say no to that right now in our current state of affairs. Um, if you didn't hear this on the news, a certain Sanford CEO wrote an all employee email um, saying that he wasn't gonna wear a mask anymore because he had already contracted COVID recovered and is now immune. Mm -hmm. um, and employees who are all in the healthcare industry didn't take well to that. And they're, um, a, a very large group of physicians and board, I think even board members, I'm not sure about that, um, responded and said, you know, <clears throat> we apologize, but our, our take is we're going to wear, wear our masks. And they had to jump in and reassure employees and the, now the public, because the email was leaked, um, reassure people that they are following protocol and um, making sure that, that the employees at, at this organization are wearing masks. So I think it really, that was not a particularly good moment for them. Um, and, and it was a political moment uh, and I don't think it went well. <laughs> so I, I think that's why I'm saying no to that, but on, in, in a regular, cycle of politics, I would say it It definitely depends on who you are. I like it. That's a very good answer. I like that. That's a, a non-committal, but yet there's some committal in there. I like that. Um, should I write a, um, a Facebook post or should I reply to a Facebook post troll? I have an opinion. I work at a nonprofit. There is a Facebook troll on something that is unrelated to my nonprofit. I have a keyboard and I have an opinion. Should I write it? Yes, I think you should respond to all of your um, interactions on social media tactfully mm -hmm. um, and by, by not feeding, fueling the fire. Um, if you do have a troll, a naysayer, a poo-pooer, um, be gentle with them. They are suffering their own battle and mm -hmm. taking it out on you. But um, responding to it rather than ignoring it shows that you are showing up for everybody and that you are a responsible consumer of social media. I love that. I love that. And the final one, which is also very tough, is my own personal struggles. I think now is, it's funny, I saw this chart um, that says uh, I'm doing okay to, holy crap, I can't do anything uh, productive. And we're all probably somewhere in the middle, if not leaning towards, my God, when is this going to end kind of mental, mental uh, thing. From a perspective of an organization, as somebody who is the owner or um, sole proprietor of content on a particular site, or your own personal page as well, is there value in um talking through your own personal struggles in a social media fashion in and with writing currently and should i write it absolutely but don't martyr yourself mm -hmm. um turn it into an into the success that it is um if you struggled with um you know a health scare talk about that and how it changed your perspective for example um, 
the, the more that you put yourself out there and it can be incredibly uncomfortable, uncomfortable for people and then just don't do it. But if you really feel compelled to tell a personal story because you think that it, it comes back to a mission or a vision that you have um, for your organization or your um, company, mm -hmm. do it. it. People want to hear personal storytelling. They want to hear the human inside an organization. And the best way to show your humanity is through that storytelling, um, through your own struggle or barrier that you've that you've overcome. But being really careful again not to martyr yourself um, and and be and playing the victim of anything. I think that's that's the challenge there is making sure that you are showing um, ways and solutions to overcome a particular obstacle rather than getting stuck in that murk of negativity. I love it. Uh, Lana, thanks for playing our brand new game on the official Do Good Better podcast <laughs> of Should I Write It? Um, which is going to be now a recurring uh, episode as over and over again. So I appreciate uh, you. I have to ask you this before we dive into um, your upcoming book that you are writing, because I'm going to tease that out a little bit, is um, I wrote, and I think you helped me sort of navigate this as well. I write everything out before I post it. And so I have the ability to kind of see what it, what it reads like after my initial um, brain dump, right? I think a lot of people say um, it is, uh, like I wanna write in passion, like I'm gonna post this blog post or I'm gonna do this without sort of thinking about it. I write everything and then I sit on it and then I read it and then I edit it. And so it sounds uh, better because I think if you take a break from it and you have your eyeballs come back, is that something you would recommend a nonprofit do when they're sort of writing passionately about what they are creating? Or do you find content creation in the heat of the moment a, a value as well? Or which one do you value more? Or is it appropriate to write and edit? Because I think there's an authenticity piece that's like, here's what I believe right now. <laughs> or can you do that on in a Word doc and then can you edit it out so that it sounds a little bit more flushed out? Flat, flushed out, flushed out, yeah. I, so I would say the best thing to do is to stream of conscious that whole blog out or that whatever you're writing mm -hmm. and come back to it. Um, let it rest, give it a break, come back to it. Not necessarily because you might edit anything, but there might be something that happened in the 24 hours that you let it kind of go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Something might have happened that gives you another perspective in there. And then there's another learning moment to add to it. So the, I think that your approach is absolutely appropriate for almost every single writing instance that you have is to write everything down and let it simmer, let it stew, let it sit and come back to it. Um, because between that time, you're gonna give yourself the grace to add some experiences or even just time to say, oh wait, I am so glad I did not post that. That paragraph was terrible or I can't believe I was gonna say that or I, yeah, there's a misspelling in it or, you know, just something. So I think, yeah, write it down, pause, post. Great advice, I like that. I like that a piece of advice. I think you should listen to Lana because she's very smart and so smart, in fact, that she's finally doing something which she has been talking about for a very long time. And I am so ecstatic for you is that you are actually in book writing mode. No longer will you be editing people who have exclamation points uh, galore. You are going to write your own book and I'm so pumped about it. Can you tell me and everybody who's listening what it's about and why it's so important to you. Yes. So I am writing a book about Alzheimer's and um, it is really addressing some of the, the social and political there. I'm going to write about politics yeah, you are. Yes. The book, um, and the, the policy that's driving some of the decisions that leadership makes around around Alzheimer's and why we don't have treatments and 
why it's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. It's the third leading cause of death in North Dakota, by the way. Interesting. Um, and it's the only one in the top 10 killers of Americans that doesn't have a treatment and doesn't have a cure. And there are 6 million Americans living with the disease. Globally, there's 47 million. And it is, it is an epidemic that um, we just don't know what to do with. Scientists have been, some scientists have been spending their whole lives trying to figure out this, the mystery of Alzheimer's. And so in the book, um, I write a lot about uh, policy that is, is helping, policy that's not helping, um, certain actions that we can take that can help, um, that we know can help like diet and sleeping and re stress reduction and all the things that are healthy for your heart and things like that. Um, so there's some actionable content in there. And then there's um, some of my own personal story in there. My mother was diagnosed at age 61 back in 2013. So, so we're moving into year eight with the disease and she's an end stage right now. And so there's a little bit of memoir in there as well um, that recounts some of the more significant points in our own family's journey that help convey the issues with the disease that so many millions of us are are going through right now. Um, so that's the book. Um, and I have been trying to write it for years and started to write it, but it just never felt like the right time. And for some reason or another, it feels like the right time in my life to actually to make it happen. And it's it's exhausting emotionally and and also just researching and interviewing people and doing all of that work it is has kind of become a second job and um but it's it's amazing i love it it's it feels like what i was meant to do it feels like the reason my mom got alzheimer's was to teach me how to teach other people about alzheimer's so yeah that feels really good I'm uh, I'm so excited for it. I'm so excited for you. You have been um, gracious enough to kind of post a little bit of your writing recently and sort of uh, rough draft pieces. Mm -hmm. And it is unbelievably uh, pull the curtain back to kind of how A, the process of writing works, which is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And B, it just reminds me of how good a writer you are. And so I just appreciate you sort of posting that because it uh, makes us all want to step up our game, I think. Uh, and so I'm using that as inspiration to get back into the writing game again. I lost it for a while. I was into like, hey, I've got a podcast. I can just talk about stuff. And clearly I like talking, so that's fine. But you've uh, you've done a good job of sort of, I think, re relighting that sort of writing flame. I appreciate uh, you for that. How on earth can people get a hold of you? They're listening to you. They're like, I need more Lana in my life, which A, yes, you do. You just need to just A, follow her and then just and listen and read and whatever. But how do they get a hold of you? I think this is very important because they're going to have a lot more Lana fans, I think, after this. I hope so. Yeah. Um, you can find me on my website, lana.co, L-O-N-N-A dot C-O. That is my website. You can subscribe to my newsletter, which can be super fun. Um, I'm also a Twitter geek. So my handle is at Lana Whiting. That's, um, that's me on Twitter. I refuse to give up on that on that platform. And then I'm also writing a lot on medium.com and my you can just do a search for my name or my actual website is lana jean whiting.medium.com and um, that's where I'm mostly at these days. Uh, I'm also obviously on Facebook still still stuck in that. Um, but yeah, find me on my website is probably the best way to find me and would love to chat. You should. And you will, uh, we'll drop all of those links in the, uh, in the show notes below. So make sure that you go sign up a newsletter and go follow because it's, uh, it's brilliant stuff. It's very, uh, fun to watch you go from point A to point B. Like, it's just very fun to watch you sort of unleash some of this stuff, um, writing wise. And I'm so joyful that you could be on the official Do Good Better podcast. It is about damn time. And I'm so grateful for you. 
uh, I would not be in a position uh, that I am in right now without your help. You are very uh, critical to my um, being to where I am and helping me publish and write and, and write better. I just, uh, you just made me a better writer. So I appreciate you. Uh, and if you want to be a better writer too, go follow Lana because you, you're just going to be better by reading what she writes in the first place. So uh, Lana, thank you so much for being a guest on the official Do Good Better podcast. We'll talk to you guys next time and go sign up for all the things. Lana, below, go. Do it now. Bye.